it's that time. Time for a shop tour. I don't even know where to start. This is going to be a lot of fun. I feel like I'm going to relive some memories talking about all these machines. And hopefully I don't blabber too much. But shoot, some of these machines have been around since I was a kid. But before I get started on the shop tour, I want to say two things. With equipment comes maintenance. And this is one thing that I learned back in the day that you need to have good records of maintenance. So I want to talk a little bit about that. You need to maintain equipment for the best uptime and best resale value of your machine when you're done with it. There's no reason not to do maintenance. The other thing that you need to take into consideration is placement of equipment. Now I'm small, so I mean that's kind of to my advantage that I don't have, you know, multiple rooms or multiple buildings and equipment everywhere and trying to streamline that workflow. But basically in this room, it's right now we're at blank paper, blank envelopes behind you here. And most jobs start here, get printed here, then go to trimming, binding, packaging, palletizing, and then out the door. So it, it's one straight line. Now, not all jobs are like that because sometimes things get printed, cut, tabbed, scored, you know, they're jumping around a little bit. But for the most part, we try and do one straight line. Uh, so we have to touch things the least amount and walk and move material the least amount. Uh, you know, it doesn't make a huge difference in a small shop like mine, uh, but over years and years of printing and doing jobs, it does add up. But on a, a much busier shop, it is much more important that everything be thought through and streamlined as much as possible. I thought of it too. Uh, like I have things strategically placed uh, where I need them. So pretty much anywhere in this room, I'm within like five steps of tape and empty boxes. You know, right here. For anything that I'm finishing here, I got boxes to box up my finished product. Right here. Boxes, business card boxes, and here, four boxes. So at those three locations, you know, just a couple steps and I have boxes to box up a job and finish it. So it's all about the least amount of steps and touches that uh, increases your profitability. So maintenance, I have a very, very simple maintenance log, but I mean, everything from my rooftop air conditioner, uh, you know, I can see the, the year, who did the maintenance and what happened. So here I have filters, you know, uh, wire to capacitor, replaced capacitor, stuff like that. So now I know when things were done and it just helps you to make better decisions as to when the end of life of a machine is and so on and so forth. I mean, when you're, when you're doing too much maintenance, there becomes a time where it's okay, it's got to go. But, uh, all the machines, you know, I try and record how much you paid for it. Uh, and when, and then if it's something that has a counter on it, I, I include the counting as it goes so I can kind of gauge, you know, how much was done a year, you know, are we using it more, are we using it less, just to try and record as much information as possible. Um, so maybe I'll refer back to this uh, when I get to each individual machine. Okay, this is one of the machines that was here when I got here 
after college. Uh, tabletop folder. The Challenge 305 cutter. The floor model stitcher. And I believe this one was here too. Uh, but those four pieces of machinery are ones that I did not purchase, but I still like them. I'm keeping them around. Everything else is something that I purchased within the past 11 years. This one uh, takes me back to my childhood days. Uh, I remember running this thing uh, when I was a kid. I remember my dad would set a chair here so I could stand on it and look in here and, uh, and fold brochures uh, and uh, church bulletins. I remember folding church bulletins on here. That was fun. I mean, dad printed them. Uh, probably at that point, it was on a AB Dick 360. Uh, he would print them and then it was my job to, you know, each week to go fold the, those uh, bulletins, which probably took a few minutes, but I thought it was cool and uh, it was fun. But uh, shoot, this thing keeps chugging along uh, for many years. This is our only way of folding things. Uh, so if we were doing right angle folds, have to run it through here twice. Uh, but uh, very little maintenance had to be done to it. I mean, it's cracked now, and uh, but uh, I think I just replaced uh, two belts on here. I was looking in the, the service manual, and that's really all I've ever done on this machine. Uh, it could really use a new set of rubber rollers. It, they're really hard. They don't uh, stick. They don't, they don't pull really well on coated stock, but you know, it's still a nice machine to have. AB Dick 58 folder. They're cheap too. You can pick them up pretty cheap. So this Martin Yale Tabber, uh, we bought when we only needed the tab, one tab per mail piece. Uh, since we bought this, uh, you're required to tab each mail piece twice. Uh, so we have to run it through here twice. But I picked this machine up locally. I want to say I want to say I bought it off eBay and then went and picked it up. But, uh, it, was a, it was a big mail house and they didn't need it anymore. They had uh, bigger equipment. And uh, I should probably invest in, you know, a Kirk Rudy or, or something else that is more commercial and uh, would be a lot faster. Something that would, you know, do both tabs at the same time and be faster, uh, a faster speed. I mean... Those machines are probably five times as fast as this thing. But, you know, this is paid for. It runs fine. So we just keep on running it. So, Rhino Tough Punch. I forget the number on it. Uh, I bought this thing used. These things are kind of pricey, actually, if, uh, if you go new. I want to say they're several thousand dollars. Uh, but I bought it used. Um, I was first used Rhino Tough uh, equipment when I was in college. Uh, we had a Rhino Tough punch similar to this, uh, and also the automatic coil crimper, which should be kind of nice to have here, but I don't. We, I just uh, crimp by hand. But uh, I would highly recommend the Rhino Tough uh, equipment. I mean, I like it. It's heavy. It's a lot of metal. Uh, I'm a big, uh, big advocate for any machine that is heavy. I mean, the heavier the better, um, just because that most likely means it's over-engineered and will outlast you. Uh, and that's the kind of equipment that I like to invest in. Uh, shortly after this, uh, we got the, the coil inserter too. Uh, I, I replace an old hand punch unit uh, with with these and uh, boy it makes it so much nicer uh, for for longer run stuff and uh, like I said in other videos too I uh, there's local binderies around me that only bind so I utilize them for 
you know, larger quantities. If I get into hundreds or thousands of books, I just outsource the binding. Uh, this is more convenience for the short run stuff. And then I keep uh, plastic coils uh, in stock here. Uh, I just skip every every two millimeters, so I get six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. I think I have eighteen, maybe not twenty, twenty-two. Uh, so I have enough on hand to to get a small amount of books bound. This was a recent purchase, uh, a counting scale. Uh, really speeds up uh, for counting uh, anything that has weight. So I use it a lot for envelopes, uh, or even if uh, even if you're printing something and the power goes out, and you have a stack of paper, and you're like, "Well, I don't know how many was in there." You can easily throw it on here, count it, and it saves you a ton of time. Uh, again, I was turned on to these when I was in college. Uh, you can use it to count uh, to to mix ink. Um, if you're an offset guy, uh, it's, boy, there's probably a dozen of uses. Oh, another use is uh, uh, booklets. Um, so if I, if I outsource a job, um, we did a job last year where we were doing like 10,000 booklets. I outsourced it, then I brought it in-house, and then I did the mailing. So I just used this scale to count out uh, the different amounts of booklets for the different mail routes. So it just speeds up. It's a big time saver. You know, granted that this is a really tiny piece of equipment and I kind of thought about just not even including it. It is a must have for digital press people. Uh, it's a toner vacuum and you just got to get one to keep, uh, keep your equipment as clean as possible. Over here we have the uh, baby pack shrink wrapper. I remember, shoot, actually, I don't think I bought this, but I did assemble it. I forget who bought this. I don't know if it, uh, it was my mom or my sister or my dad, but anywho, uh, it's been real good to us. Um, I think the only maintenance I really had to do on it, I had to replace this wire that melts the uh, the shrink wrap material and I replaced this tape um, and that was all stuff that was readily available oh and we replaced the heating element inside there but this thing's 10 years old or more uh, but yeah it's uh, it's nice for shrink wrapping uh, material it, it's good finished product look uh, to what you're printing Okay, we got Old Faithful here. This is the Konica Minolta BizHub Pro 1200P uh, This machine has was 22 or 23 million clicks on it uh, it, it just runs and runs uh, it, I believe it's It's probably about 10 years old or close to it, but air fed feeding. This right here is your print engine. Uh, this turns the paper over. This is a post inserter and uh, will also do the three hole punch. This is a saddle stitch unit. And then this is a receding stacker slash stapling unit. Uh, this machine replaced our Xerox uh, Nuvera 120. Uh, we were one of the, one of the first uh, places to install a Nuvera, and uh, that was nice. That that machine was really nice. I've got nothing against Xerox machines, but it was really expensive. the The machine was really expensive, and then the keeping it running, the clicks were really expensive too. So that's why I went to Konica and saved a lot of money by switching over to this and the quality is great as far as I'm concerned uh, I mean the blacks on this machine will never look as good as a color machine black but it's still as nice dense black 
and it's uh, cheaper to operate than a color machine when it comes to the black and white clicks. Uh, but I've got only good things to say about this machine. Uh, we used to have a, a stacker that stacks on a cart in here, and actually it's in the other room. Uh, I still have it, but uh, I took it out of there. I think they were having problems with it, and I never used it anyways. Uh, I thought it would be nice to have that, because that's what our Nuvera had, but uh, what actually I found out is that basically running everything to this tray is handier because you can monitor the quality as it's running. I mean, stacking it on a cart is all nice, but it's closed up, so if a lion develops or something else develops and the print quality isn't that good, you will literally print 2,500 sheets of paper, and then once you unload it, you'll see that it looks horrible, and you got to throw the whole thing out. And that happened to me uh, at least one time, I can remember. Uh, but, you know, since then, we just used the, the receding stacker, and you know what? That's cheaper, and uh, yeah, keep it simple. I think when this thing gets replaced, I don't even think I'll do the saddle stitcher anymore. I'll probably end up just getting a booklet maker, the kind that gets thrown inside this finisher, um, just to keep it simple. And uh, yeah, but no, the 1200 Pro, uh, I forget what number they use now, but uh, yeah, it's been real good to me. Uh, I'd certainly recommend it. Next machine is the Konica. A Curio Press C3070. Uh, this machine, it's a really nice machine. And uh, if you want to see the detailed review, you know, watch some of the other videos. But uh, it's great. Uh, we're getting close to 600,000 clicks on this machine. It's about, it was installed in August, September, October, November, December, January. It's five months old. Um, it runs and runs. Uh, better than I would have expected and uh, Yeah, it's great um, Have the fiery rip on here. Uh, I have the ability to do banners with this uh, Bypass tray here and then three vacuum feed units and then we have uh, simple folding booklet making there's no trim on here got the receding stacker and the post inserter um, but yeah, I, uh, I think it's a great machine and, uh, it's, uh, you know, certainly the, these two digital presses are, uh, you know, what we really built our business on. All right. The good old 6,500. This, uh, this machine we bought new, um, that was probably about 10 years ago, too. Well, no, it was probably more than that. We had a smaller color Xerox printer. That was a Xerox 3535. And uh, that thing was... That made a nice quality print, but it was not any. It was not a production machine. It was a, a low-cost color copier uh, that, that got us into the... The digital printing market and uh, this machine was a lot faster and a lot cheaper to operate uh, that's why we went with the c6500 and uh, you know it's been it's been really great uh, I had a service contract on here for the first four years or maybe five years uh, and then we bought the C8000, so then I had canceled the contract on here, and I serviced it myself for the past five years, and I've I've probably doubled the amount of clicks um, on it. Uh, it has close to eight million clicks on it, and uh, that second half when I was servicing it uh, was so much more profitable. Um, my, the costs per click were about a quarter, uh, and that would, but 
I should clarify, not, not 25 cents. The cost to operate the machine was a quarter of the cost of paying Konica to service the machine. So, I mean, if you're, if you're paying four cents a click to have Konica service it, uh, if you did the service on your own and you're competent, uh, it'll be down under a penny a piece. And, uh, and that's huge when, uh, when you're running it, um, you know, hard. I mean, when you're talking, you know, take that three cents and times it by four million clicks, it adds up. Uh, but it is work and it's risky. Uh, you know, you can, you can screw up, a, you know, two, three thousand dollar board or part and, you know, you're going to have to pay for it if you're servicing it yourself. But, uh, no, this was kind of an experiment and a learning opportunity for me to see if I could service my own machine, uh, one, see if I can service it, and two, what would the cost savings be? And the cost savings was worth it as far as I was concerned. Um, so right now I'm, I'm looking to either get another 6500 that's real cheap, uh, and this will probably end up being a parts machine, or getting another newer machine, you know, a 2070 or a 30, another 3070. But uh, no, the C6500s are kind of known worldwide as just little workhorses, and they run real well, and the quality looks just fine on them. So I am very happy with the C6500. Okay, this little guy is my envelope printer. Uh, I typically do maybe a thousand envelopes or less. I'll print them on here. Other than that, I outsource them. Uh, but uh, the Envelope Imager CS uh, it was a pretty cheap uh, way to get into printing envelopes. Uh, it's real nice. It just uh, it just uses regular HP cartridges, and I uh, I get bulk ink to fill them up so it, my printing costs are uh, are really really low per envelope i'm talking like a tenth of a cent and uh you know it, i use it to uh address envelopes or actually print you know the return address on envelopes and then uh and uh use use that um sell that to the customer so yep uh I like the machine. It is slow. I would, uh, I'd love to replace it with one of the, uh, Rena Mach 5s or, or one of those machines, but I just can't quite justify it. I don't print enough envelopes to, uh, to really make my money back on those. Um, so that's why I haven't upgraded it yet. But, uh, when I, uh, stumble upon one that, uh, that's reasonable. I, I, I'll probably replace this thing. Right in this spot is where uh, I used to have a Konica C8000. Uh, that's a color machine. Um, and I got the 3070 to replace that machine. It was, it had a, way too much downtime. Uh, and I found out my research that it's just the design of the C8000 created issues for two reasons. Uh, the lower transfer belt on the C8000, there's a belt. Uh, you know, on this machine, it's a roller. And the belt, it was just too complex. There, it would have problems uh, way too often. The other reason uh, that I didn't like that machine was there's a belt on the fuser and again on on the C3070 or 6500 there's no belt on that fuser uh, there's actually a belt above it but it's only a belt on a roller but anyways that I could probably make a video just about the things that weren't that good but it's okay because Konica fixed those things and they replaced them with better things uh, but right here is where the C8000 sat. And go back further yet, we had two offset duplicator presses here. Uh, we had 
a Ryobi uh, 2800 CD duplicator. Ran that a little bit. Uh, that was ran a lot earlier uh, when I was, you know, in middle school, high school. Uh, and beside that, we had an AB Dick. Oh, uh, what number would have that been? Like a 98 something? I forget. Both of them were little chain delivery duplicators. And that was uh, the bread and butter that my parents built the business on. Uh, they both would have had T heads, so they both could have done two color. And uh, actually right here where the C3070 was, we had an image setter. Uh, it was an Agfa image setter. But then after that, uh, we just did uh, direct to plate polyester plates and that was like a laser printer. Um, so those were here. And not too long ago, right here is where I used to have a Ryobi 3404DI. And that's uh, an offset, a waterless offset printing press. Um, where you basically, uh, you send your, your image information to the press and it burns for the plates directly on the press so that your registration is spot on for your first sheet out. Uh, that press was really nice, uh, but it still couldn't compete with these digital presses. And uh, I think there was a day where those machines really shined but now that uh, that small window doesn't really exist because the short run stuff makes sense here. But then immediately uh, when you get towards any long run stuff, it makes sense to outsource that to a trade printer. And uh, it doesn't even make sense to run it on that offset press. So that's why I made the decision to get rid of that and uh, make more room for digital machines. It's kind of a sad, sad day uh, because I, I really like offset presses and, you know, that's, I don't know if it's the, me the mechanical uh, nature of an offset press, but uh, offset presses are, are just have a special place in my heart because they're fun to run and uh, well, that's what I got started on when I was younger. This is uh, a relatively new machine as well. Uh, this is uh, the AutoCoat Pro, made by D&K uh, Laminating, I guess. Uh, but that's uh, an American-made company. They're out in Illinois. And it's a single-sided laminator. Uh, before this machine, I had a Fujipla Pluster. And that was a single-sided machine. It was much smaller. It only needed 110. It didn't need air or anything. And uh, that was your only option for um, a self-contained unit. Uh, because I looked at D&K when I was thinking about, or when I was shopping around for laminators, uh, when I bought that, the old one, but uh, their machines were feeders, laminator, cutter. And it was, you know, 20 foot long machine and I wasn't into that. I wanted something smaller than that. So that's why I got the Fujipla machine. Uh, it was good, but it was certainly nowhere near commercial. Um, it was a really light machine. Um, so I decided I wanted something heavy. You know me, I like the heavy machines. And uh, this one was it. And it's simple. It has a very simple feeding mechanism. Uh, the, uh, you know, everything through here is all simple. There's lots of bearings, chains, and things like that, that a guy like me can service. And I like that. Um, the other thing, the other reason I went with the D and K is they make the film. And, uh, for years and years when I outsourced our book cover laminating, uh, the super stick film made specifically for digital presses, uh, was made by D and K. So I figured if they make the film, they're going to make a machine that applies it correctly. So I get the film from them and, uh, yeah, it all works great. 
that's another reason I got rid of the Fuji Plus Luster is uh, you could only buy their film. And when a manufacturer corners you in to only buying consumables from them, it just really grinds my gears. I don't, uh, you know, when I buy a machine, I want to be able to buy parts or materials from anywhere and run on that. Uh, so that was another reason that I got rid of that machine and replaced it with this one. Uh, it requires uh, house air. I think it's like four CFM. It's really nothing. Uh, and uh, 220 volt. I think it's a 30 amp breaker. Um, but yeah, it's... It comes up the temperature super fast. I mean, it's like probably 10 minutes or so. Um, and I'm, yeah, you guys have seen it run many times. Uh, it runs real nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've only had this for six months or so. And uh, yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that this thing's going to be running 30 years from now. You know, it'll. It's just going to go and go and go, and that's that's the kind of equipment that you want to to invest in in the long long haul. Another solid heavy piece of equipment here. Uh, this machine we wouldn't be able to do anything without, and it is a very reliable machine. Um, my parents bought this thing used. Um, the, uh, the cutter we had before this was a hand-operated uh, guillotine. Uh, Challenge makes it, uh, which has a crank on top that you crank the clamp down, and then there's a little safety, and then you pull a lever down and cut the paper. And uh, we had that for many years. Uh, and I remember as a kid, my dad would let me hang on that lever and uh, and cut that paper and I was probably only 70 80 pounds and I had to really hang on it to cut through a big stack of paper but uh, manually cutting stuff is just very slow so uh, we soon after we built this print shop we upgraded to a hydraulic cutter and uh, it speeds it up so fast uh, this machine came as a three-phase machine uh, and at the time we did not have three-phase so we put on a, uh, a single-phase um, motor uh, and, but since have gotten three-phase in the building so we switched it back to three-phase um, so this thing uh, Let's see here. Mostly blade changes are what I wrote down in the maintenance on this. Uh, I think the the manual calls to replace the the hydraulic fill, fluid uh, every year, and uh, I don't always do that, but. Uh, it's good to at least every few years change that because I know one time I replaced this fluid and it looked like black motor oil uh, when I poured that stuff out of there and put in uh, some new oil but even though it's not getting annual fluid changes it still runs like a top uh, back in the day uh, I believe it was the clamp cylinder we replaced. Uh, one of the seals in there was bad. Um, and that the uh, we had a service guy do. That was probably when I was in high school. Um, but since then, it's just fluid and filter that uh, in greasing uh, I was having problems with the uh, the uh, measurement system, uh, but uh, it was really just dust. Uh, there's a an optical sensor down underneath here that uh, 
that needs to be cleaned. But other than that, yeah, this thing uh, just cuts and cuts. Um, I don't, we, the, the knife gets changed a few times a year, uh, but I really like to try and stretch that out as much as possible. Um, and also notice the cutter is right next to the perfect binder here. And that uh, is on purpose so that as soon as book blocks get cut down, they get thrown right into the binder and there's no moving them. Uh, originally, our old perfect binder was across the room here. So we would cut down book blocks and carry them over there, bind them, carry them back, and then we would trim them here. That was before we had the three knife trimmer. Um, so that, uh, that is on purpose to have the cutter right next to the perfect binder. Uh, cause I, I mean, I'm not even a big fan of putting stuff on carts and carting it around. I mean, it, everything can be as close as possible. It really makes it efficient. Uh, and that way, you know, one guy can print, cut, bind and trim, you know, depending on page count, should be able to do a thousand books a day out of here. Um, so yeah, boy, rabbit trail. It's a good machine. I would highly recommend the challenge uh, for any type of paper cutting. Uh, the Morgana Digifold. Uh, this thing's pretty great because it takes a flat piece of cardstock that's printed and will score it and fold it. And man, it really does look sharp when it's creased correctly and the fold's right on. I mean, it takes something that a customer wouldn't really want, a flat sheet of paper, and folds it to a brochure uh, and looks real nice um, in one step. Uh, it's, it's rather slow. This is the slower model. They have another model that's like, I don't know, it's like four or five times as fast. It's nuts. Um, but, you know, we don't do a whole lot. And the thing is, is it runs by itself. I can literally stack this thing up, tell it to fold, and, you know, go out and sit at my computer and send emails or make quotes. Uh, and then, you know, when I hear it stop feeding, I can come back and load it up and unload it. So the fact that it's slow isn't that big of a deal just because I can be doing multiple things. I remember I went to uh, Long Island, New York. I drove up there, uh, my dad went along, and uh, there's a guy, oh, there it is, CMC Machine Corp. Uh, they sold this, uh, I wanna say it was like 17,000 uh, bucks. It's kind of expensive for a little piece of machinery, um, but you know it's been good. The uh, the the system to uh, put all the uh, the parameters in there, the user interface. Sorry, uh, is it was tough to learn, but what, now that I know it, it's you know it's fine. It's no big deal. I can I can run it very quickly and efficiently. And the newer units have a different interface, so they've solved that problem. Uh, but I need to find myself like a Rosback or something, just a simple score slash perf machine, because every once in a while I just have, you know, a, a, just a few tickets that need to be perfed or a couple cards that need to be folded. Uh, or something that needs to be creased uh, because and that's the other thing this machine will only run heavy card stock anything lighter than 65 pound cover is uh, is gonna give you problems uh, you know we try to run like hundred pound text through here and you can do it but you generally end up having some waste or jamming issues uh, this machine just doesn't like text weight paper. And that's that's right out of the box. I mean, it says that in the manual that it's for cover stock. 
but it'd be nice if you could run text weight through there. And that's what I'd want a, uh, a ROS back for. Um, what else about this thing? I don't think I have had to do much maintenance at all on this. No. It's a, a 2011. It was oiled and calibrated. 2017. Uh, the dealer serviced it. There's certain calibrations that need to be done every once in a while that I can't do. It takes special tools, um, and I think they might even hook up a computer to it. Mm. I don't, maybe not. But anyways, I had the, the dealer come out and recalibrate everything. Um, but that was 2017. This is three years later. And in between there, I replaced a fuse, a blue fuse. So other than that, it's just been churning out work for me. It's pretty reliable. And there's this, uh, there's a chart up here that uh, gives you, uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll just show you. Kind of gives you a, a slice of how your paper is moving through the machine. And then the different folds, you know, single fold, double parallel gate fold, letter fold, concertina. And then I wrote on here, uh, those are the letters, a lowercase h, lowercase d, capital E, capital G. Uh, you need that in order to set it up correctly. So I just hang that there for quick reference. I don't have a whole lot to say about this machine here. It's, uh, it's a nice machine, it's very simple. Uh, it's a single head drill, again by the Challenge Company. They're the same company that make the guillotine cutter and the three knife. Uh, and they also make the three hole punch. I have a three hole punch in the warehouse that I rarely use. I should probably just sell it, but I know as soon as I sell it, I'll get a job that I need to three hole punch a bunch of stuff. Um, so yeah, it uh, drills one hole at a time. It is foot operated, it's kind of manual. Uh, the other three hole punch is a hydraulic, so it's just a, a button and the hydraulic comes down. But uh, it, if you wanna set up to do a three hole punch, the, these little tabs that you can put in at the different spots, and then this flips over those, so you can you know drill one hole Push that over to the next one, put your piece in, drill the second hole, and then do your third hole. So it spends most of its life right there. So an 11 inch sheet of paper will fit in here and it'll do one hole. Uh, it does, it pretty much just drills calendar holes, this machine does. and. The, the random other holes that we'll need to do for, you know, tickets or whatever else, uh, you know, our customers are asking for. But uh, the, the chips that it make, makes uh, come out the back here, come down a chute, and uh, that's where all the little pieces of paper come out. So that's just runs on 110, and, uh, uh, I don't, I think it's with the other one, with the other three hole punch I have the uh, the sharpener. There's a, a carbide sharpener that we use to to touch up these drill bits, but the amount that we use them, it just, I mean, they hardly ever need to be sharpened. And uh, here's a wax stick. You can just put a little bit on the outside edge. I like to go on here and hit the inside too, so then the outside and the inside of this bit will be waxed as you're drilling. You want to do that because if you overheat that and you blew it, it's going to get soft and then it's going to dull and then this will eventually crack and it'll tear apart whatever you're, you're drilling a hole in and that drill bit will also fly apart. I 
I think I've seen that happen, either here or at school, I forget. <laughs> Here's a classic. The good old boss stitch floor model stitcher. Uh, so this table here uh, can be flat like this with the back fence on there. Uh, it can also, that fence can be taken off and that, well, that's not going to go down because the fence is on but it can be moved down to uh, the saddle position. Uh, you can adjust the length of the stitch. Uh, you can make a lot of other adjustments uh, for the stitch to sit left and right. It's uh, pedal operated here. But uh, I think um, if my memory serves me correctly, my parents bought this to stitch atlases. So they got another printer to print a big historical atlas um, and then they hand collated them and then stitched them here. Uh, so yeah, these are, these are pretty readily available. Uh, you can pick them up, you know, for a thousand bucks or less. Uh, and again, this machine will probably outlive me. It's heavy, and uh, as long as you oil it, you know, the only thing you're ever going to have to replace on this is potentially the, the cutting knife that cuts the wire and a belt on the back. I mean, other than that, it, it's just going to run and run. You can't beat that. So our first perfect binder uh, was a CP... Oh, no, it wasn't. Uh, it was a tabletop perfect binder, and I think standard, or was it bind fast, or maybe it was a standard bind fast, I forget, I should have looked that up before I did this video, but uh, that was our first perfect binder, uh, mom and dad had always outsourced their perfect binding, and uh, Because I remember they, you know, I guess crunched the numbers and figured that it would be something they want to bring in-house. And uh, so I remember the first book, or one of the first one, was uh, about ice harvesting. I just remember that. So they printed all the guts on the duplicators, uh, collated everything, and then, uh, and then bound it on that tabletop. And I think I remember I was I ran that tabletop binder a little bit, and it was all manual basically. Uh, like there was a manual clamp in it. You put your book block in, clamp it, and it. I think it had some sort of a milling device, and then took it over the the hot melt, and then applied the cover. But each time you had to load your cover in, and I think you had to pull the book out. And the bind quality was, eh, I mean, it wasn't that great. Uh, but we pretty quickly outgrew that. And uh, we bought a CP Borg 3001. That's the, the binder before this one. They're a lot shorter. Um, and they bought that new. Um, I don't even know. I probably don't have record of when they bought that. But uh, we ran that up until last year. It finally died, and uh, I want to say they probably got that. It probably would have been about 15 years old. Yeah, it would have been right around there, um, and that that didn't require much maintenance. Uh, but that had, uh, that was running fine, and then, uh, it wouldn't feed covers, um, or when it would feed a cover, it would, it would mess up, and I tried to fix that thing, my goodness, uh, I tried swapping out motors, I tried swapping out boards, and, you know, I called, uh, a CP board service guy, 
and they said, well, the machine's discontinued. We don't even try and fix it anymore. So I was out of luck. Um, so I was uh, checking out Craigslist, eBay, uh, wired bids, and uh, on there, uh, this machine was for sale. So I bought this, that auction, uh, which is, I'll, I'll restart. So I bought this online on a website called Wired Bids. Uh, I bought actually my collator on that uh, and my mailbagger. I wonder what else I bought on there. Um, I think that's it. But uh, I was in a pinch because I, I had like 500 books or something I needed the perfect bind uh, and my perfect binder is broken. Uh, so for that job, I outsourced it locally. I had another bindery company bind that, but I hate doing that because that's, that's a waste of money. But you know, it kept my customers happy. So, boy, I'm doing a lot of rambling on this one. Uh, I bought this out of North Carolina. So <laughs> I rented a Penske truck shortly after my daughter was born. And uh, I woke up at five o'clock in the morning. I drove down to North Carolina. I stopped once for fuel, picked this thing up, rolled it onto my truck, and then drove back. And I got back here close to midnight, unloaded it, and then returned the truck to the rental place. Uh, yeah, I was driving for like basically 20 hours. Um, that's risky. <laughs> I tell you what, but I didn't feel like stopping. I just wanted to get it home. And, uh, you know, it was kind of fun. I enjoy driving uh, long distance like that. And, uh, you know, it's fun to see the countryside. And it's a change of pace. It's, uh, it's something different than printing every day. So, but anyways, I got... I picked that up on a Friday, and then I think Saturday, I wheeled it in here, hooked it up, hooked up the electric, uh, and you know it, it ran. Uh, it ran really well. Once I got the hang of how the system worked, um, it was starting to uh, drop the books as it, as the carriage went across. So the carriage would go across and right when it got towards uh, the cover, it would just randomly drop the book. And uh, I found out that that was the wiring harness, which makes sense because uh, I think this book, this binder had about 500,000 binds on it. So it bound 500,000 books when I bought it. So that carriage went back and forth 500,000 times the wire was obviously wearing out and there was enough voltage drop at that exact spot that it would sometimes drop enough that it would, wouldn't sense the book and it would stop and the machine would stop. Uh, so I had to put a new wiring harness in. I think I, that was like $1,200 to put a new wiring harness in. Uh, but yeah, the binder only cost me 8,000 bucks and 8,000 bucks is cheap because these things brand new are closer to $80,000. So, um, that's the, the, other, uh, the other thing that I had to fix on here was a solid state relay. The relay that turns the uh, heating element on burned up. And I mean, it burned up and out of there. So I just desoldered that relay out. Uh, God only knows how much the actual board cost that needed to be replaced, but that solid state relay was like 30 bucks. So those are the only th two things I had to do to it to get it to tip top shape. And uh, you know, at, at that price, um, yeah, it doesn't take long to pay off a piece of machinery. So certainly, you know, buy used machines, be careful, you know, be, you know, think about it and make a good choice. 
but boy, if somebody else can take that initial hit, my goodness, you know, do it. You know, it's a little, there's a little bit of a risk there, but uh, in certain cases, I would totally recommend it. Uh, did I, I didn't even talk about what the machine does. Uh, yeah, it's a perfect binder. <laughs> Watch my videos if you want to see how it works. Um, so the book block, you drop your book block in here and uh, it'll take the book block across here. There's two heated rollers here in the tank of hot melt adhesive. That's EVA adhesive. This binder can come with the EVA or the PUR and uh, the EVA is probably the more popular one. Uh, the PUR is a little bit more expensive, uh, but they claim a flatter lane book. Um, this just happened to be the EVA one that I bought. Uh, and then over here is where the cover gets clamped on your book. It automatically feeds the covers in. It'll do a positive or a negative crease. I think it does like 16 creases, up to 16 creases, but in all reality, you're only ever going to need to do one, two, three, four, five, six. So, uh, and that's for a book that would have uh, the spine creased, a hinge crease on the front and the back, and then a a uh, a flap on the front and the back of the cover. Then it'll drop the book out and take it over into the next piece of equipment. Okay, this is the Challenge CMT 330 three knife trimmer, which will automatically do three sided trims for all the perfect bound books that drop out of the perfect binder when they come in here. Uh, here's a cooling tower, so the books slowly go up this tower and it gives it a little bit more time for that adhesive to cool off. Um, and then uh, this machine here. Well, I don't even know if we can see inside there without it being turned on without the lights on. Oh yeah, kind of. Uh, but anyways, the book will come through here. Uh, well, shoot, I could just turn it on. Uh, the book comes in, and this clamp will move the book out there, and it'll do the sides, and then it'll take the book up, move it through, and do the face trim on all the books. Bring it back, and then exit over there. This conveyor belt is actually made to be rotated and come out the side here, but I don't like the way that uh, takes up more space, so I just put it up against there and put this table here to catch the books. Um, Challenge also has a book feeding feature and a book stacking, uh, but this was an earlier three knife trimmer and uh, doesn't have that option. But, uh, shoot, it would really be nice because that, uh, it'll stack like three foot high of books. Uh, and it's a lot nicer than this setup I, that I have here. But, you know, this is what I got. So this is what I run. Um, this is something else I bought used. Uh, shoot, I don't know what the, I, it's probably got to be close to 100,000 for a new one. Uh, maybe it's more like 80. Uh, but I this was a demo. I bought this and it had 20,000 trims on it. And I think it has like 260,000 trim now. So, I mean, we ran it a lot. And it was it was very, very lightly used when we got it. And it was still a pretty penny. I think... Uh, yeah, it was installed in 2010, and I paid 49500 for it. So, and that, that was very, that was discounted quite a bit. So the newer ones are a lot more expensive. But uh, it runs like a tank. I know uh, the only thing... Well, I, I replaced fuses on it before. Um, 
and greased it. Uh, there's a belt actually uh, that uh, transports the book back and forth. There's a big belt that goes all the way back and forth on this thing and it has teeth in it. And that was loose so that as it would take the book back to be trimmed, it would jump a tooth <coughs> and then trim the book shorter than it should be. So I uh, adjusted that to tighten that belt and that's pretty much the only major uh, maintenance I had to do on this. And I say that's major because there's a large linear actuator that that belt lives inside that I had to take out of there. And it's a big six foot long piece. I mean, it's kind of a mess to take it out, but it wasn't too terribly bad, but it was a, it was a significant uh, undertaking. But other than that, uh, blade changing, fusing, or fuses that I'd replaced. This perplexes me. I don't remember doing this. It says replace the pneumatic hold down cylinder. And I think that's the cylinder that was giving me problems uh, in one of my earlier videos where it was loose. So maybe I didn't tighten that in there. That, that was my own fault, but... Anywho, back to the equipment tour. My goodness, rabbit trails are just left and right. Uh, totally recommend this machine. Uh, before we had this, we trimmed everything down on the uh, trimmer over here, and we had to trim each side of the book. And basically, if, uh, if it took two hours to bind, you were gonna spend another two hours trimming. Uh, and this right here is all one process. So if it takes two hours to bind, you have no trimming to do and the books are ready to box up and give to the customer. So a three knife trimmer is worth its weight in gold. Okay, here is the uh, collator. This I also bought on uh, wiredbids.com. Uh, along with, uh, well, that's where I bought the, uh, the perfect binder as well. But there's a couple different configurations that you can get this machine as. Uh, it has two air fed towers, and then it has the booklet maker here, which does the stitch fold trim. And, uh, this machine is great. And the main reason that I went with this machine is because I wanted the air fed towers. Uh, our previous booklet maker was a CP Borg AE22 friction fed collator. So it had 22 bins. Uh, that sucker's long because it had the, the vertical bins uh, the whole length. Uh, if I can find a picture, I'll put a picture in here. Uh, but sold that because uh, friction-fed collators do not do well with gloss paper. And I was getting more newsletters and booklets that were gloss, and you had to run so slow, and, or you had to try and constantly be jogging the paper. It was, it was time to go. But that, uh, that AE-22 collator, uh, was one of the most expensive pieces of equipment that my parents bought back in the day. And I remember it just fit in our garage. I mean, you couldn't get around to the other side of it unless you crawled underneath the, uh, the exit tray uh, or opened the garage door and walked around it. But, uh, but we needed to uh, get something that would handle the gloss stock and... Uh, this thing's probably a good bit faster too, and it's automated. Uh, our old collator didn't have automatic setup, but this uh, will automatically set up the trim, the fold, the stitch uh, with the push of a button. So that saves a ton of time, uh, and you can do a lot more with this than our previous one. Uh, I also have the uh, stacking unit, so we could collate these and reverse the direction of these towers so the paper comes out the back side and we could collate books 
and then perfect bind them. Uh, you know, if we were printing the text pages on offset press, uh, which we wouldn't be doing, but well, we have the capability of doing that. Um, so yeah, I really like this machine. It runs really well. We run it often. Um, trying to see here. Bought this in 2015, so it's five years old. Uh, when I bought it, it had 2.6 million on the counter. And right now it's it's got three million. So I mean that just goes to show this is three this has made three million books and it it's just running strong. It it'll keep on going. Uh there's no doubt in my mind. Uh the only thing that I had to do I replaced the knife and I have a I have a spare knife now. Uh, there's a top and a bottom knife in here. There's a flat one on the bottom and uh, a regular knife up top. And I have a backup handy now uh, to be able to throw in there. The only other thing that I needed to do on this was to replace this solenoid. And that solenoid uh, picks up that gate that stops the book. So after it trims, it picks that up. So the booklet comes out. That was fried. I think uh, if you get the manufacturer part for that, it was like $200 or something. But I found the part online, uh, searched the item or the part number, and I think this solenoid was like 50 bucks or something. It's It was so cheap. So when you find a broken part, don't necessarily go to the manufacturer of said machine for that part because they are going to nail you. Uh, look everywhere else. Uh, try different part numbers or even parts that look similar. Uh, or if it doesn't have a part number and it just has like a voltage and you know, an amp or a resistance, search for that. And it, uh, those parts are so much cheaper and it's, it's, it's worth it to save, save some money. Uh, the other thing, one of the first videos that I put on YouTube was fixing, uh, the lights, uh, in these trays. And I actually have another one that blown or that blew so I need to make another video of fixing that. Uh, but other than that, this thing runs like a top. Here is my MBO T49 right angle folder. Uh, it's just set up right now to do a, a straight fold. And the right angle unit, you know, comes in here and then this uh, delivery was set over here. Uh, I bought this off eBay some guy in New Jersey actually uh, was selling it. He was, I think he was retiring or going out of business or what have you. But uh, yeah, I think it was like 1100 bucks, which is nothing for a commercial right angle folder. Um, <coughs> I was searching for quite a while. Uh, to get one of these because up until this uh, any right angle folding we needed to run through the tabletop folder twice and this is so so much faster um, the only downside is that it didn't come with the rollers on the delivery there should be a bar across here that holds two rollers it didn't come with that so uh, I jerry-rigged that quickly one day and I've just been using it for years since then but I did track down parts I got old printing press parts old folder parts uh, and some other bars here uh, I'm gonna have to make a, a short video because I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have a, a craft uh, craft time with Dan as he makes a better uh, delivery.
roller because that, that irritates me. I need to fix that. But uh, yeah, so again with this machine, uh, I, I rented a Penske truck and I drove out to New Jersey. Um, you know, they rolled this onto the truck and then I brought it back home and, and hooked it up. Uh, it's three phase. Um, I did have to replace a belt. These yellow drive belts, I replaced the belt on the right angle unit. I don't know if it was the original one or not. It was in real bad shape. Uh, but I ordered two because I'm sure that one back there is on its way out too. Um, this belt goes underneath this cover and it drives all of those rollers in the fold unit. So I have, uh, I also got perf wheels uh, for this. So I do my perforating here. Um, I could get uh, slitting wheels, I could get score wheels. Um, you know, I could, they make gatefold attachments, but you know, I, I didn't really need to, don't see an, a reason to do that. Um, it has a counter, but uh, yeah. And uh, well, the reason I went with MBO too is Again, an MBO is what I learned on in college. They had a newer MBO, but uh, I found it really nice. And uh, before this, uh, we had a baum folder here, and it was all steel rolls, and it was like 1960s or something. It was a real dinosaur. and. Uh, I wanted something nicer and uh, MBO makes a nice folder and at that price for a used folder you just can't beat it. I would totally take that chance. So yeah, I don't regret buying this thing at all. I totally recommend an MBO. Okay, back here in the warehouse is uh, the mail bagger. Uh, you've seen this on a couple videos. Uh, we mail or there's a couple magazines that we run through this machine that puts a USPS uh, postal approved uh, sleeve over the the uh, mail piece. You just uh, you just drop it right in here, and it automatically seals it, and then drops out, comes out the conveyor. So real handy machine. We used to uh, bag all of the magazines by hand and seal them with a tabletop sealer. That gets old real quick, and uh, I mean, this machine basically replaced two people, uh, so it's so much more efficient uh, to do it this way. But yeah, I really like this machine. I totally recommend it. Okay, one of my favorite machines, I've probably said that a couple times, is this Bell & Howell four-pocket envelope inserter. Uh, so for many, many years, we inserted envelopes by hand, and uh, you just can't compete uh, if you're going to try and uh, be competitive with other printing companies that have envelope inserters. Because I remember we had a job that was like 5,000 envelopes, and it would take two or three people about eight hours probably to insert and seal 5,000 envelopes. And that was a long day. I mean, it was fun to hang out and talk with people as you're, as you're working, but shoot, oh, that gets old. So I bought this, um, I bought this from Wired Bids as well online, uh, which is, uh, which is kind of scary because you can't see it in person. Uh, you're just going off the photos and or videos that uh, that company posts. But uh, yeah, this this machine will do, you know, that that 5,000 envelope job that would take a day, I can do in easily two hours. It'd probably be an hour and a half 
if everything runs perfectly, that it's just so much faster. Um, so we have four pockets here. One, two, three, four. So you can put a return envelope, a card, a letter, and a flyer. And uh, then your, uh, your empty number 10s get stacked in here. If you want to see more detail, just go through my other videos. Uh, then it collates all those, it inserts it, it uh, seals it. There's a little tank of water here and then stacks them. And uh, this machine cost 1800 bucks. You know, it, it was pretty cheap. And this is a 1970s machine. And uh, it was scary because I never ran anything like this before. But I knew I needed that automation. And I just took the plunge and I bought it, hoping that I could figure it out. Uh, and... Uh, and now I consider myself to be proficient on it. You know, I have, uh, I've ran it for, boy, it's got to be four years since I bought it. Um, but I have ran tens of thousands of envelopes on here. I mean, all, and it's simple. That's the, that's the reason that I really went for this machine too. And I liked it is because there's, it's very simple circuitry, like all the electronics, you know, are, are simple switches. Uh, you know, I'm a simple dude. I can, I can troubleshoot that, you know, if, you know, fixing that type of electronics, the, uh, the computers, computer boards, I can kind of fix too, but I'm, I'm not near as comfortable on those as I am these older machines. Uh, I have, you know, oil there that you know every time you use it you just go around and you hit all the oil points they're painted red uh, and there's an, a bunch inside here too um, all these spots need to be oiled but shoot as long as you oil it uh, you know what I think I had to replace a switch too oh, where was that Oh, here it is. This switch here broke. So th that is one thing I needed to replace. That's the emergency stop. Um, other than that, I mean, some minor electrical switches will probably wear out. But as long as you oil this thing, it'll run and run. I lied. I also put a new belt on it. But hey, that can be expected. That's a wear item. Uh, there's this knob right here, and that's how you change the speed of the machine. Uh, there's kind of like a slip clutch there that that uh, adjusts. But uh, I uh... nope. There we go. Um, I never even took it off the pallet that it came on, and. Uh, and the reason I never did is because it's kind of nice if I ever have to move it, it's on the pallet. And the other reason is I'm six foot four and, uh, right. I'm standing on the ground here and this is at a good working height. If I moved it down to the ground, I'd be standing up here and I'd be bending over that much further. So I like my machines to be raised up higher than they're made to be. I mean, the paper cutter that I showed you earlier, uh, I actually have two inches of wood underneath that whole machine to bring it up higher so that uh, I'm not hunched over when I'm running it because I'm still hunched over when I'm running it. But, uh, yep, these old, old machines, uh, I think I found even a website. I think the website that I got some suckers from and that switch, uh, there's a guy that, you know, he, uh, refurbishes these old machines these old inserters and, uh, and sells them. And, you know, there, there's people going after them and I can totally, totally see why, because they're simple and they will run and run and run. So totally recommend the automation that this inserter would bring you. Um, yeah, it's, uh, that was one of the best decisions because 
now the money I make on, you know, larger inserting jobs where I'm inserting 10,000, 20,000 envelopes, the profit from those jobs pay for the machine. So it's like I paid for it many times over. So that's great. Okay. I don't use this one yet. It is still on the pallet too that I bought it on. I saved this one from the scrapyard and uh, I might not even say what it is. I'll just let people comment in the description if, uh, if they know what this is to, uh, to post a comment. But these machines are amazing and I cannot wait to clean this thing up and see it running because it is going to be fascinating. This is a classic and uh, that'll actually make some pretty cool uh, footage too when I get this thing cleaned up or the process that I go through to clean this up and get it running. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you know what this is, post in the comments. So there you have it. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. Hopefully you didn't fall asleep. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you were entertained at the very least. Um, but that is, in a nutshell, the equipment that we use and, and how I like it. I mean, I'm, to, to be honest, everything in this building I'm very happy with, and that's why it's here, because if I was unhappy with, it'd be gone. Uh, but uh, thanks for watching. I don't forget to comment about uh, what you think that machine was that I showed you a little bit earlier and uh, stay tuned and, you know if you haven't if you haven't subscribed do it and let me know what else you guys want to see I'll do my best to make that happen see ya